um, pleased to be here to speak on this today as part of the overall of policing in Ireland, very important pr um, programme of modernisation. Um, and I just wanted to make three points, really. Um, the first is just around the, the geographical challenge and the communications around it. And clearly, the new divisional structure that's envisaged is a very different thing in the Dublin area than, say, the Galway, Mayo, and across area. And even just, you know, reflecting on colleagues working in constituencies like Mayo and just this, the sheer size of it and the scale of it to, to, to look after as a TD, to look after on a divisional basis uh, for Angarda Siakana with the distribution of specific functions across that. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting, but I think there's a real communications challenge around how that's going to work. Just like we've seen the importance around communications around the vaccine rollout and other things, we really need to be able to explain to people, look, what does this mean? Where do I go? Thinking about, you know, Wexford to Bray, you know, if, if, if part of it is in Wexford, but the crime end is down in Bray, and if I'm a shop in Wexford and I've been broken into three times and I have to go to Bray to talk to the crime specialist, it may work better, that's fine, but we do need to explain carefully how that's going to work and, and why it's better uh, and, and that it is better, um, and it's, it's, it's very, very different in Dublin. Re, you know, reflecting on, on what Deputy Murphy and Deputy Manan O'Connor have said just in relation to, and sorry, this is this, the second point I wanted to make, in my own area, in the Kalini, uh, Shankill, Dunlira area, there's a new town being built right beside me. There's 30,000 homes, 30,000 people expected to live there in Cherrywood. It's right beside the M50. It's on the Lewis line. We're extending the Dart line to it. It's an extraordinary piece of infrastructure. It's full of retail. Um, there's, there's huge apartments going up. And it's a, it's, it's a good project from a housing perspective. But there's absolutely no policing plan for it. And I can't understand it. And I can't understand, you know, if any other deputy came in here and said, there's a town of 30,000 people in my community and there is no policing plan for it, there isn't even the identification of a site for a station for it. Um, you, you, you know, I, I, don't see how, I don't see how my constituency is different in terms of, of what it needs. And I've raised it again and again through the Joint Policing Committee. I've spoken with local Gardaí about it. I know what their needs are, but there's no plan. And I, and I must raise that today, and I must ask the Minister to check that out and, and to see what is envisaged. If you look at how, how this is going to be done in the future and you have you know, the idea of a Garda Commissioner as a CEO looking after all of the different assets, you have, what, 19,000 people, possibly 2 billion euro worth of, you know, of, of, of funds going into Garda Siakana. It also has a vast estate management function. It has a huge property estate and how that's going to be managed. And again, I look around my own area for examples of this. Dawkey Garda Station was closed down and fine, um, but it's just sitting there going to rack and ruin. It's not being used for any Anything. We have a significant administrative pressure in the Dunlera area. Uh, you know, on Garda Shikona, they need place for administrative staff. They're looking at renting it in various places. That's a station, it doesn't have to be a Garda station, but it could just as easily be a place for administrative work. It could be, it's under the, the aegis of the OPW at the moment. It could be used as brownfield housing. The same is happening in the Kill of the Grange station. They're just going to rack and ruin. Meanwhile, Cabinteely Garda station, which I had, okay, you know, I, I was there recently to, to visit members of Angarda Siakona just to see the conditions that they're working in. And, and I honestly, I mean, they do great work, but I honestly just don't understand how they work out of such a small and insufficient premises relative to the area that they're, that they're required to cover. And it's Cabin Teeley that's understood to cover the Cherrywood area. Now, I know, look, I'm, I'm highlighting it, you know, for my own particular area, but it, it, it points to the challenge of, I don't understand yet from what's been published how the estate management is going to work. What is the link between Angarda Shikona, uh, the ownership or otherwise of their assets, the OPW, the planning for policing, converting properties, using properties, and I haven't seen yet, and it may be there, but I haven't seen it yet, a, 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 a good explanation of how that's going to work. Um, finally, if I could just make the point, uh, it's, it's, it's a question really, it's in particular, the Garda Youth Diversion Office is something I've, I have a long-standing interest. I used to be, declare an interest, I used to be a member of the Section 44 Committee, which oversees um, the implementation of the Garda Youth, of the, the Garda Youth Diversion Programme. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting office because, in a way, that is a centralised office of expertise. It's also an, a quasi-judicial office in the sense that everything in relation to youth crime or, or you know, youth offending or where young people come into contact with Angarda Siakona, and clearly we try and keep them out of the criminal justice system as much as possible. But the director there is making decisions about whether to prosecute or not. So it is a sort of a specialist function in itself already. And 
my, uh, what I have observed over time, given its quasi-judicial nature, given its extraordinary importance in crime prevention and in diverting young people from the criminal justice system, it seemed curious to me, more than curious, problematic, and we put it into the annual report year after year after year, how it seemed to be invisible in the organisational structure of Angarda Siakana. I recall one year, I think it was 2015, 2016, it simply didn't feature on the organisational chart of Angarda Siakana. And whether that was an oversight, I, do, I don't believe it was, because we were, we were raising it again and again, but it, it spoke to me about a cultural problem at the time. Now, I think that's been rectified somewhat, but the reason I raise it is because it, was a, it is a centre of excellence. It is what we're talking about, dividing up functions and making it more professional and making it more focused in the various areas. This is already a functional office. And again, I'm just not sure how that's replicated around the country. Are there going to be, is that, is that function going to be in every division? Is it going to be in some? Given the level of expertise that's needed in it, the judgments that's needed in it about whether to prosecute or not, given the already insufficient links that it has to TUSLA, given the fact that it doesn't have anybody from the DPP's office in there to help make prosecution decisions, which lengthens the period of time that it takes to, 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 to make decisions or not, I sort of wonder um, how, how that's going to work. And it, what I mean by that is, if a decision is made not to prosecute a child, because what they really need is a, a therapeutic intervention. They need, you know, uh, anger management, or they need training in relation to sexual violence, or whatever it happens to be. They're referred into the TUSLA system, but there isn't sufficient link to be sure that for Angarda Siakana, who have made that referral, to know that the child did get that therapy. And, you know, that is, these are important crime preventative measures. What I'm saying is it's already insufficient and this is a centre of excellence. Similarly, in relation to the reason I make the DPP point is, when you're going to prosecute a child or not, time is very important. You can't have a child who has been in an incident at 14 being prosecuted at 17, and all of these things draw out and draw out. Look, I'm using my chance to, to raise it with you, Minister, and I appreciate I'm out of time, but I, I just, I, I hope that we can get more clarity as the bill goes through on that point. Thank you.